Welcome back everyone, my name is Nick930, and to celebrate the upcoming release of the Resident Evil 2 Remake, I want to share with you the complete history of Resident Evil. Resident Evil, also known as Biohazard in Japan, is a survival horror game franchise that puts a heavy emphasis on enclosed spaces, limited supplies, and plenty of monstrous enemies. The series is often credited with being the start of the horror genre in gaming, and while this isn't necessarily true, it's understandable why the mistake is often made. Resident Evil helped define the genre, and has been the benchmark for what makes a good survival horror game for over two decades. And while the franchise may have had a bit of an identity crisis throughout the 2000s with more of an action-oriented approach, it still managed to redefine gaming norms, and has continued to be one of the most influential gaming franchises of all time. But in order to better appreciate how this series has managed to persevere after 23 years, we're going to start by looking back at how the series started with the first entry in 1996. In 1993, Takuro Fujiwara, creator of Capcom's first game, Sweet Home, proposed that the small team of developers create a remake of the game, using the advanced 3D graphics of the then-new PlayStation platform. He elected Shinji Mikami to lead the project, who was initially against the idea due to his lack of interest in horror. Mikami then spent several months creating a prototype, which was initially designed to be a first-person shooter game, but after seeing the excellent work done in one of the world's first horror games Alone in the Dark, decided to borrow the idea of a fixed camera in order to take advantage of the pre-rendered backdrops and create a more realistic looking atmosphere. The development team would then continue to expand throughout development, with multiple ideas cropping up in prototype builds that would never see the light of day, including a full cooperative mode and the ability to change weapons without needing to use the inventory menu. Many of these ideas would eventually find their ways into future Resident Evil games, but it's interesting to see the remnants of these decisions like the dual character storyline still present in the final product. Resident Evil finally released for the PlayStation 1 in 1996, and despite expectations being low due to the unusual survival horror concept, the game sold well past Mikami's expectations, and was the first game to ever be referred to as survival horror. The original Resident Evil takes place in the outskirts of a fictional Raccoon City, whereas either controlled Jill Valentine or Chris Redfield, who are both members of a special police rescue team called STARS. After losing contact with Bravo Team, Alpha Team is sent in to investigate. But after being ambushed by several mutated dogs, Alpha Team is separated, and most of the members are forced to take shelter inside an old abandoned mansion. It's here where most of the game takes place, as Jill or Chris, depending on which character you decide to play as, search the mansion for clues to the mysterious murders and uncover the truth about what caused the outbreak. The story is heavily inspired by the original Sweet Home game, in addition to classic western zombie films like Night of the Living Dead. And aside from some poor localization issues that resulted in some really bad dialogue between characters, it's one of the less convoluted storylines in the series. The events of this game would go on to define the series, with the mansion essentially being the catalyst for the overarching plot, and is often referenced throughout many of the games. Resident Evil's gameplay is what really sets it apart from other games in the late 90s though. Unlike most shooter games, Resident Evil utilizes a fixed camera angle, requiring players to move their character around the environments without knowing what to expect around the corner. The game's mansion was designed to be a maze of hallways and rooms, separated by locked doors that required special keys to open. As the player progresses throughout the story, more doors can be opened, creating new pathways and cutting down on travel time, while also introducing brand new challenges and enemies. Most of the enemies are standard zombies that shamble down the hallways and require multiple shots to kill. But other, less conventional enemies will require much more, and often can kill the player very quickly. Players can heal themselves using items like health sprays or herbs, which can be combined with other herbs to enhance their effects. But items and the inventory need to be managed very carefully due to the severely limited inventory space. Players will need to balance weapons, keys, ammunition, and healing items in their inventory, and only bring what they absolutely need, which keeps the player on the defensive and helps to retain the desperate horror aesthetic. Players can always store extra items in item crates that are in set locations around the mansion, and save their progress with typewriters, assuming that they have an ink ribbon available. This strict inventory mechanic, claustrophobic combat, and unsettling camera design help to shape Resident Evil into a truly unique horror experience, that would go on to define the entire survival horror genre, paving the way for games like Dead Space, Bioshock, The Last of Us, and even influence the film 28 Days Later. <laughs> 
In order to create a more convincing horror environment, the designers behind the original Resident Evil decided that instead of creating low polygon 3D environments, they would rely on pre-rendered background images. Interactable items in the game were still rendered in 3D, including the game's several characters, which were animated manually rather than being built using motion capture technology. The original Resident Evil released on PlayStation 1, and was re-released a year later with reworked item placement and was advertised as an uncensored version of the game. The game was then released on several other platforms including the Sega Saturn and Windows PC, with various remakes and re-releases several years later. The original Resident Evil was met with phenomenal critical acclaim, and is currently sitting at a 91% on Metacritic, and was nominated several times as Game of the Year in 1996. Its influence can be found all over the gaming industry, from its tight inventory management, its smart use of the Metroidvania-style level design in a 3D space, and its emphasis on creating truly terrifying enemies that couldn't just be mowed down like a shooting gallery. The franchise exceeded both Mikami's and Capcom's expectations, and became one of the best-selling games of 1996, cementing the IP as one of Capcom's many flagship franchises, and development for the sequel began only a month later. Development for Resident Evil 2 began almost immediately after the release of the original game, and borrowed many of the same design philosophies. However, creative differences between Mikami and game director Hideki Kamiya caused significant delays. An early build of the game featured many of the same concepts as the final version, with players exploring a police station in the heart of Raccoon City as one of the two completely brand new characters, Leon Kennedy and Elza Walker. But Mikami wanted the sequel to be the conclusion to the Resident Evil storyline. Obviously, concerned with how this would affect the franchise's longevity, Supervisor Yoshiki Okamoto hired a professional Hollywood screenwriter to pen the script, resulting in massive rewrites. The Elza Walker character was transformed into Claire Redfield to link the original game to the sequel, and the game took on a more action-oriented approach to appeal to the Western audiences. These changes pushed the release of Resident Evil 2 to 1998, and to keep fans happy, Capcom released a director's cut version of the original game that featured some reworked item placement and gameplay tweaks. Finally, in January 1998, Resident Evil 2 hit store shelves, and would become one of the most successful entries in the franchise. In Resident Evil 2, players would take on the role of either Leon Kennedy, a rookie cop, or Claire Redfield, Chris Redfield's little sister. While attempting to visit the city police station to check up on Chris after the events of the first game, the two heroes stumble into a massive zombie outbreak in the heart of the city, and are forced to separate after crashing their vehicle. The game starts immediately with players surrounded by zombies on the street, and are forced to seek shelter in the nearby Raccoon City police station. From here, the game takes on a very similar tone to the original title, with players needing to uncover the mystery of what happened while also solving puzzles and defeating various enemies. Resident Evil 2 featured two plot lines, each following one of the new protagonists, that would occasionally interconnect. However, the story does take an unexpected turn towards the end, which greatly expands on the lore behind the series and opens the franchise wide to a slew of new stories surrounding government conspiracies, secret organizations, and cover-ups. The plot in general is like the first game, but feels greatly expanded and heavily inspired by Hollywood cinema. This focus on action also had a slight impact on the way the game played as well. Resident Evil 2's gameplay features far more action than before, with players facing off against much larger groups of enemies. Ammunition, while still limited, felt more common, and encounters with enemies were often difficult to dodge. The police station is crawling with zombies, often blocking hallways and even reaching through windows in certain areas. New enemies like the infamous Licker up the difficulty curve substantially. In fact, according to series creator Mikami, Resident Evil 2's difficulty was designed to be much harder to discourage game rentals. Outside these new enemies and the increased frequency of running into them, Resident Evil 2 plays mostly the same as before. The game still featured the same fixed cameras with tank controls, and players were required to carefully manage their inventory, splitting the limited space between required keys, weapons, and healing items. Players could also leave helpful items behind, which could be picked up later when the player is given control of the new character. This new timeline swapping feature allowed for four different playable stories, which greatly increased the game's replay value. Visually, Resident Evil 2 was made using the same technology as before, with the team at Capcom taking pre-rendered backdrops and superimposing low-polygon models and characters over top of them. In the early build of the game, nicknamed Resident Evil 1.5, the characters featured significantly less polygons, allowing there to be far more zombies on screen at once. But after the game's redirection, the team decided to up the number of polygons used on the protagonist, resulting in a limited 7 zombies per scene requirement in order to keep the game stable. Still, this was enough to create vastly more stressful sequences than what were available in the original game, 
and thanks to some smart level design and camera work, the 7 zombie limitation made it seem like you were being chased by hordes of zombies in the streets. Resident Evil 2 was met with high critical acclaim, with many praising the multiple storylines and more Hollywood-focused aesthetic. However, a few reviewers noted the outdated control scheme and poor voice acting work. Still, despite all this, Resident Evil 2 was a massive success, becoming one of the most popular titles on the PlayStation platform and inspiring an unusually large volume of spin-offs and sequels. After finishing work on Resident Evil 2, the Capcom team split their efforts between several different Resident Evil projects. Initially, the third entry to the franchise would have followed a new character named Hunk on board of a cruise ship. However, the impending release of the Sony PlayStation 2 forced Capcom to completely abandon the project, and they elected to make Ayoma side project the next main installment. Ayoma and his team were working on a Resident Evil 2 spin-off that featured a new storyline that would follow Jill Valentine as she explored the streets of Raccoon City. Unlike the previous games, Resident Evil 3's level design focused mostly on the city streets, and was much larger in scope, with players capable of utilizing alleyways and storefronts to bypass roadblocks and large groups of enemies. New to Resident Evil 3 was the terrifying Nemesis, a towering creature that would frequently jump out at the player and chase them around. Nemesis was directly inspired by Terminator 2's main antagonist, and was an unstoppable force that took away any bit of comfort the player might have had revisiting the Raccoon City police station. Outside of trying to escape from the city and the immortal Nemesis, the game's narrative doesn't really do much to push the Resident Evil story forward. It's one of the shorter entries in the main series, and doesn't really come off like a true follow-up to Resident Evil 2, which makes sense considering it wasn't initially intended to be. From a gameplay perspective, Resident Evil 3 made some minor improvements, benefiting the more action-oriented approach to the gameplay. The number of enemies on screen was once again slightly increased, and various traps like explosive barrels could be used to deal with enemies. The game's puzzles were simplified to make room for more action, and a new dodge move was incorporated, allowing players to avoid taking damage when being grappled by the enemy. To keep the increased amount of combat balanced with the limited inventory, Resident Evil 3 introduced the ability to craft ammunition, using a portable bullet-making device and gunpowder items found in the world. Combining the gunpowder types would create different types of ammunition, just like how the herbs function, and ammunition overall felt more plentiful. RE3 also introduced a new choice mechanic, where players are forced to make split-second decisions that could greatly affect the game's storyline. Visually, Resident Evil 3 made some notable improvements. The resolution of the game's pre-rendered backdrops was slightly improved, and the variation of zombies increased, with some zombies looking like ordinary civilians, police officers, or even having different body types. Resident Evil 3 was received with high praise from its audiences. Fans loved the expanded scope of the game environment and the slightly improved combat mechanics, and the introduction of Nemesis was a much-needed addition that introduced a new level of fear to the franchise. However, some critics felt the story failed to deliver, and the reused assets like the police station were indicative of the development team cutting corners. Still, considering this game was never meant to be anything more than a short spin-off title, Resident Evil 3 is a worthy sequel, and a great bookend to the original trilogy on the PlayStation 1. However, there was one more Resident Evil title released on the original PlayStation. In early 2000, Resident Evil Survivor released in Japan and Europe, and would be a slight departure from the core design of the typical Resident Evil game. Survivor was designed around using a light gun peripheral controller to shoot targets on the screen. But due to concern that violent video games were responsible for the Columbine School shooting, the North American release of the game featured no light gun compatibility, requiring players to move the crosshair using the standard PlayStation controllers. The game took several elements from the traditional Resident Evil game and incorporated them into a new first-person perspective, and introduced players to a brand new character and setting. In Resident Evil Survivor, players assume the role of an unknown pilot who suffers from amnesia after a helicopter crash. The player explores a fictional Sheena Island off the coast of Europe in what is apparently the second major virus outbreak only months after the incident in Raccoon City. As with most Resident Evil storylines, the plot focuses around the protagonist investigating the area for clues while simultaneously identifying an exit strategy. But the main protagonist doesn't feature the same personality of the classic cast of characters, and the storyline doesn't match the quality of the narratives in the main entries to the series. Resident Evil Survivor's gameplay, while somewhat similar to the core game, is simplified significantly to account for the new first-person gameplay. The first-person camera allowed for full 360-degree movement along the x-axis, and allowed players to manually aim their weapon at specific enemy body parts for the first time in the series. Players would still need to stop moving in order to aim their weapon, but ammunition was no longer limited, and players only need to keep track of their current magazine capacity when engaging hostiles. Survivor still offered some basic puzzles to solve and various keys to unlock doors, but the UI was simplified, and the world itself felt less interesting. 
Because of the new first-person perspective, Resident Evil Survivor was the first entry in the series to feature full 3D rendered environments, as opposed to the pre-rendered backdrops. This resulted in much less impressive looking environments, with low jaw distances and a significant lack of variety. Resident Evil Survivor received mediocre reviews and was the first entry in the series to be received poorly. Many criticized Capcom's decision to remove the light gun support from the US release, while others noted that the game was boring even with the peripheral. The slow pacing of the Resident Evil franchise, coupled with the poor visuals, suggested that the series wasn't ready for a first person perspective, at least not yet. Soon after the release of Resident Evil 2, the core Capcom development team tried to port it to the Sega Saturn. But because of various technical roadblocks, the game eventually was transformed into an entirely brand new project. Resident Evil Code Veronica was intended to be the real Resident Evil 3, but due to the development for the new console platform and a publishing deal with Sony, the game was instead renamed to appear as a spin-off game, while the Nemesis game was given the official Resident Evil 3 title. Code Veronica focuses on Claire Redfield, one of the protagonists from Resident Evil 2, as she searches for her brother Chris. After being captured by the Umbrella Corporation, she's imprisoned on an island near Antarctica that suffers another zombie outbreak. Much like past stories in the series, Code Veronica sees the main character exploring a small environment, searching for clues that explain what caused the zombie outbreak, while also locating a way to escape. Code Veronica's story helps to expand on the original game's plot, with several returning characters, and it also helps to set up future titles like Resident Evil 5. From a gameplay perspective, Code Veronica is one of the last entries in the series to utilize the traditional Resident Evil style. Veronica features the same tank-based movement, fixed camera positions, slow-paced exploration, and puzzle solving that fans have come to expect, but with a few minor tweaks. One of the biggest changes to Code Veronica is the fully rendered 3D environments. Unlike Resident Evil Survivor, Veronica has more detailed and varied environmental designs, with a camera that could pan and track especially in long corridors. This allowed the developers to create more intense sequences with significantly more enemies on screen at a time, only further upping the ante for action in the series. Code Veronica was received exceptionally well, and was one of the highest rated entries in the series up to that point. The game was initially intended to be a system seller for the Sega Dreamcast, but due to the poor sales of that platform overall, the game would later find new life on Sony's new PlayStation 2. However, one common complaint among reviewers was the game's lack of innovation in the control department. The tank controls simply weren't working anymore, and Capcom would need to find a way to redesign the controls in their next main entry if they wanted to please their critics. A year later, an arcade version of Code Veronica released, featuring the same storyline and premise, only with the first-person design of 2000's Resident Evil Survivor. The game was designed initially as an arcade game, but was later brought to the PlayStation 2. While Survivor 2 followed the storyline of Code Veronica very closely, it's still not considered to be canon, as it's revealed that the events of the game are all a series of nightmares Claire has after the events of the actual Code Veronica. Survivor 2 offers two unique modes, Arcade and Dungeon. In Arcade mode, the player runs through a simplified series of events from Code Veronica, needing to find keys, fight zombies, and defeat a series of bosses. The game features a unique timer that, when expired, would trigger the nemesis to spawn and chase the player, forcing them to move to the next level. In Dungeon mode, the player is forced to survive against waves of enemies, with chain kills increasing a combo meter to boost the player's score. Visually, Survivor 2 felt like a step back, likely because it was designed more for the arcade cabinets rather than the PlayStation 2. The game featured a distracting UI that didn't fit the theme of the series, and the overall experience felt like a cheap knockoff. Survivor 2 received abysmal reviews, even worse than the original Survivor game, and was another example of Capcom trying to milk the franchise dry. In 2001, another spin-off Resident Evil title released, this time for the portable Game Boy Color. Resident Evil Gaiden was an isometric take on the classic series, with combat being triggered when in close proximity to the enemy, and requiring the player to initiate an awkward quick-time event to attack. The game's narrative features the return of Leon Kennedy and Barry Burton as they explore a cruise ship that suffered a zombie outbreak. Gaiden features a dumbed-down version of the classic exploration and item management, while also needing to contend with several zombies. But due to the limitations of the hardware, several compromises had to be made, especially to the combat. Walking into an enemy would trigger a first-person mode, with a small target moving back and forth along a line, requiring the player to fire the weapon whenever the target was within range of the enemy. It's a painfully bad design choice that made the game a chore to play. Resident Evil Gaiden was received poorly by most critics, with many saying the game's storyline was buried under poor visuals and weak gameplay designs. Because of a deal Capcom had with Nintendo to port all their main Resident Evil games to the GameCube, Capcom decided that the original game needed a facelift, in order to be better appreciated by fans looking to get into the franchise for the first time. This resulted in an entire remake of the original game, with updated graphics, improved voice acting, and reworked gameplay mechanics. 
Resident Evil Remake featured the exact same story as the original game, but with a few minor tweaks like the addition of a previously cut antagonist, Lisa Trevor. Other tweaks include changes to the game's map design, pacing, and atmosphere. Some of the most significant changes in the remake altered the way the game played. The inventory space was expanded slightly, with some objects not taking up unnecessary space anymore, and items around the game were placed in entirely different places. Even the layout of the mansion changed slightly, with new locked doors, a previously cut graveyard sequence, and changes to the enemy placement. The dogs, for example, which are infamous for scaring the crap out of people in the original game, now jump out at the player later on, keeping even veteran players on their toes. Other changes include zombies that came back to life if they're not burned, and improvements to the control scheme. In order to more easily develop the game for the GameCube, Capcom decided to use pre-rendered backdrops again, just like the original PlayStation Classics. This allowed the small team to more easily recreate the environments, and add in special enhancements to help the environments look more realistic, like various particles and moving props. The camera would pan slightly just like it would in Code Veronica, but was still set in fixed positions in line with the original style. This remake of Resident Evil was met with positive reviews all around, with fans praising the improved visuals and faithfully recreated game world that pays tribute to the original without being a direct copy and paste job. The game's control scheme was still criticized, but it was mostly overlooked as it was intended to be a remake of the original game. And personally, this is one of my absolute favorites in the series, due to its expert use of tension, pacing, and visuals that have aged remarkably well, especially thanks to the re-release on the PC and modern consoles years later. Soon after the original game released in 96, development began on a prequel title that would take advantage of a new Nintendo 64 peripheral that would reduce loading times. To account for the limited storage, the environments and overall game design were condensed, which inspired the claustrophobic subway environments of Resident Evil Zero. But after development continued into the year 2000, Capcom was forced to abandon the planned Nintendo 64 release, and instead updated their visuals and released the game on the new Nintendo GameCube. The game's storyline follows Rebecca Chambers, a member of the Star's Bravo team, and Billy Cohen, a former Marine officer convicted of murder, as they investigate a zombie outbreak related to a biological experiment involving leeches. The story links directly into the original Mansion story, but doesn't do much else to expand on the lore aside from introducing some new characters. Zero plays mostly the same as the past entries, but the game's inventory system was reworked, with the storage chest being removed entirely, forcing players to drop unneeded equipment on the ground instead cutting down on the constant back and forth that fans have come to expect. Zero also introduced two characters that could be freely swapped between, and even controlled simultaneously depending on the situation. Visually, Zero utilized the same design as the Resident Evil remake, with pre-rendered backgrounds and a fixed camera position limiting the field of view. The game was later remastered for more recent console platforms along with the PC, but was criticized for making no noticeable improvements. While critics appreciated the visual and sound design, there was a mixed reaction to the new gameplay changes. The reception to the new dual protagonist swapping feature was mixed, and the game's reworked inventory had fans torn, with some saying the feature was unnecessary. RE0 would be the final entry in the series to utilize the traditional fixed cameras and slow-paced gameplay, and the next main installment would change the franchise forever. But as development for the next major installment continued, Capcom outsourced development for another light gun Resident Evil game to a Japanese developer called Kavia. The result was 2003's Resident Evil Dead Aim, which would be the first game in the franchise to utilize an independent third-person camera. In Resident Evil Dead Aim, players control Bruce McGivern, a member of an elite team tasked with disrupting Umbrella operations, as he investigates an ocean liner believed to be transporting a Paris strain of the T-Virus. Bruce eventually teams up with a Chinese operative named Fong Ling, was given the same objective, but instructed not to work alongside Bruce and his agency. The game generally has players running back and forth throughout the dimly lit ship, shooting zombies, collecting useful supplies, and opening various doors, but is also the first game in the series to feature a third-person camera that follows the character from behind. The game's controls were still awkward, and limited the control of the camera to the x-axis, much like the Survivor spin-off games. But it's likely the concepts used in Dead Aim were used as the basis for Resident Evil 4's design. Resident Evil Dead Aim was received poorly, but is one of the higher rated entries in the Light Gun Survivor series of games. Reviewers praised the mix of the free third-person camera with the first-person controls, and said it was the closest the Light Gun games have come to creating an original Resident Evil experience. In the same year, Capcom released Resident Evil Outbreak for the PlayStation 2, and it was the first online capable multiplayer entry in the series. Outbreak's story takes place during the initial Raccoon City incident, and focuses on a group of new characters that learn about the incident while drinking at a bar together. The game is split into multiple scenarios, each covering a different character as they attempt to navigate the zombie-infested streets and escape before the military blows up the city, 
The game's plot was designed this way to encourage multiple playthroughs to go along with the new multiplayer gameplay. The idea of a multiplayer mode for Resident Evil was intended to be a separate game mode for the original Resident Evil 2, but because of the hardware limitations and difficulty getting players to coordinate together, the idea was put on hold. Outbreak had some interesting changes though, like new character animations and the ability for enemies to freely travel between rooms, requiring players to hold or block doors while their friends search for key items. Resident Evil Outbreak was met with okay reviews, but many complained about the lack of innovation to the core mechanics and a failure to incorporate voice chat capabilities, making the online experience frustrating. A standalone expansion called Outbreak File 2 released only a year later and received roughly the same criticism. The franchise was becoming stale, and the tried and true concept of running from shambling zombies, solving puzzles, and managing an inventory was losing its appeal among fans. But all that changed with the next major entry to the series. Resident Evil 4 started production soon after development for Code Veronica had begun to wrap up, and would undergo several rewrites and design changes. The initial idea behind Resident Evil 4 was to create a more action-oriented experience, with a more heroic character fighting monsters in a gothic European setting. Mikami, however, felt the concept was straying too far from the core aesthetic of the Resident Evil franchise, abandoning its survival horror roots, and the game was eventually rebranded into Devil May Cry, another successful Capcom game franchise. The true Resident Evil 4 was built from scratch, utilizing the same textures and concepts acquired during research for the initial Devil May Cry. This early build of RE4 had Leon Kennedy exploring old derelict buildings and European castle ruins with traditional zombies and other, more supernatural beings that would later be explained by disease hallucinations. However, this idea was later scrapped as well, and many of the concepts from this early build would be McKimmy's inspiration for his own Evil Within title years later. The final concept for Resident Evil 4 was derived from Mikami's demand for reworked camera designs. He felt that the franchise had begun losing its fear factor due to the repetitive design choices and restricted camera movement. Mikami also pushed for more streamlined combat mechanics and more action-oriented gameplay. The result was Resident Evil 4, one of the most influential third-person action games of all time. In Resident Evil 4, players control Leon Kennedy six years after the Raccoon City incident as he searches for the daughter of the President of the United States. His search brings him to a small village in Spain that falls victim to a new outbreak called Las Plegas that turns the local residents into violent shells of their former selves. Unlike all of the previous entries to the series, Resident Evil 4 doesn't feature traditional zombies, and a lot of the enemies have taken on a different style. The game's plot and writing took on a different approach too, with less inspiration from American cinema and more in line with gothic horror. Resident Evil 4's gameplay not only changed up the franchise's copy and paste design that it's relied on for nearly a decade, but also helped to influence the design of almost every third person game since. RE4 introduced a full third person camera system that allowed players to freely look around Leon's character model and aim along both the Y and X axis. The over the shoulder aiming mechanic allowed players to see their target clearly, and is still used in third person shooters like Gears of War, Uncharted, and hundreds of other games today. Resident Evil 4 also introduced the Quick Time event, requiring button presses coinciding with the contextual prompts appearing on screen. Resident Evil 4's popularity caused several franchises to incorporate similar features into their games, and the more action-oriented approach became the new industry norm. Resident Evil 4 took full advantage of the Nintendo GameCube, with full 3D rendered environments and a beautifully realized art direction. The number of hostile NPCs on screen increased substantially with massive hordes of angry villagers ambushing the player and the scale of the game was increased considerably. It was received with exceptionally high critical acclaim, and is considered by many as one of the most influential video games of all time. Despite the massive departure from the series' traditional survival horror roots in favor of a more action-oriented style, Resident Evil 4 transformed the gaming scene and influenced hundreds of games with its incorporation of quick-time events and the offset third-person aim design. Despite the overwhelming success of Resident Evil 4, series creator Mikami decided to part ways with Capcom and began pursuing other projects with new studios like Clover Studio and Tango Gameworks. Mikami's departure and the success of Resident Evil 4 would inevitably cause the franchise to depart further from its roots, as it embraced the more campy, explosive action that Capcom felt was the key to the franchise's future success. Two years after the game-changing Resident Evil 4, Kavya released an exclusive Wii title called The Umbrella Chronicles, once again attempting a peripheral-based shooter experience in the world of Resident Evil. But unlike the Survivor series, Umbrella Chronicles was completely on rails, meaning players were not given the option to explore at their own pace. 
Umbrella Chronicles didn't try to tell a new story, but instead was an arcade-focused shooter experience that let players revisit classic scenarios throughout the history of the franchise, including the original Mansion Incident and the Raccoon City Outbreak. Because of the new on-rails design, Umbrella Chronicles didn't allow for any free movement, and the classic puzzle-based inventory management was completely abandoned. Instead, players would need to shoot multiple enemies on screen and occasionally choose between two paths while also looking for optional weapon pickups along the way. The Umbrella Chronicles was met with okay reviews, with most critics applauding the fun, intuitive action experience, but many found the game to be another quick cash-in title to hold fans off until the next big installment. After Mikami's departure, new development leads stepped in to helm the upcoming follow-up to Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil 5 would build off of the solid gameplay mechanics introduced prior, but also would see a significant shift in artistic direction. For one thing, Resident Evil 5 would take place mostly during the day, in various African villages and industrial areas. The game's action and combat took much higher priority than the game's traditional horror roots, and even the original characters Chris and Jill were given a serious makeover. Chris Redfield, voiced by the very same voice actor that plays Kyle Crane in Dying Light, was now the co-founder of a special anti-bioterrorism unit, making him come off as more of a secret agent than the original police officer concept. Chris is joined by Shiva as they investigate rumors of bioweapon transactions in a small village in Africa, but after being ambushed by the local villagers who have been infected with a similar disease to the one from Resident Evil 4, both Chris and Shiva are forced to fight their way through another insane deep cover conspiracy. The game's narrative is pushed past the breaking point with some of the most ridiculous scenes in the series. Chris Redfield looks like a Gears of War soldier in this game, and the focus on making the game more cinematic and epic just made it come off as silly, and any hint of survival horror was completely abandoned. From a gameplay perspective though, Resident Evil 5 is a solid action game. The controls are intuitive and the game's inventory system was redesigned so that it functioned on the fly, removing the ability to pause the action while you search for ammunition or health. The number of enemies on screen also increased substantially, creating truly stressful hordes of enemies. However, the franchise's iconic puzzle solving had been all but removed, and any threat of running out of ammunition was gone now that ammunition could be found after killing most enemies. Quick time events also made a return, but were more obnoxious than ever, requiring players to do dumb things like punch boulders that were in the way. Another big change to Resident Evil 5 was the more linear level design. Resident Evil 4 started to go in this direction with sections of the game being locked off after certain points, but Resident Evil 5 had specific chapters, likely to help cooperative players load progress together more easily. This turned Resident Evil 5 more into an arcade-like experience, with points being awarded for kills and coins collected being used to purchase extra items and equipment. It was fun, and the game's UI was intuitive and functioned well, but it also wasn't really Resident Evil anymore. Visually, Resident Evil 5 is still impressive to look at. The amount of characters on screen with all the unique animations and designs look great, and the quality of the player model is still up to par with the more modern games today. Resident Evil 5 was the first entry in the series to be made for the Xbox 360 and PS3, and the upgrading quality from its predecessor still shows. Resident Evil 5 was met with surprisingly solid reviews. Most critics appreciated the high quality visuals and the solid character performances, something that the series has never quite managed to get right. But some criticized the African setting, saying it was racially insensitive to have a white character murdering a village of African residents, even if they were technically zombies. This controversy, and the game's massive departure from survival horror didn't necessarily hurt the overall reception though, as Resident Evil 5 became one of the best selling titles in the entire franchise and has only just been beaten for the best-selling Capcom game by Monster Hunter World in 2018. This overwhelming success convinced Capcom to continue to build more action-oriented sequels, and admittedly, based on the sales and reception alone, this was probably the right decision. But the tone would soon change with the next group of titles in the series. Resident Evil Dark Side Chronicles released around the same time for the Nintendo Wii, and featured more classic scenarios from past Resident Evil titles. Darkside Chronicles would take players through the events of Raccoon City again, in addition to the island from Code Veronica, and two completely brand new scenarios that serve as a prequel to the story of Resident Evil 4. The Darkside Chronicles would once again be an on-rail shooter experience that utilized the Wii's motion controllers to aim weapons, but a few changes like weapon customization and a new shaky camera were implemented to make the experience more immersive. However, the camera concept ended up hurting the game's presentation and made for an uncomfortable experience. While it was cool seeing the police station updated with more modern visuals, Darkside Chronicles was still met with mixed reviews, and would be the last attempt at a peripheral-based shooter experience in the franchise. Two years later, Resident Evil The Mercenaries released for the Nintendo 3DS handheld device, and featured a sort of dumbed-down version of the gameplay mechanics from Resident Evil 4, 
The game didn't have any story and it was more of a quick pick up and play arcade experience that didn't do much to improve on the franchise as a whole. But during production of Mercenaries, the same team was also working on another 3DS title called Resident Evil Revelations. Revelations was the series' first attempt to return to the survival horror aesthetic in years, while also retaining the more modern control scheme introduced in RE4. Revelations takes place after the events of RE4, and helps to piece together the narrative leading into Resident Evil 5. It features Jill Valentine again, only now she's a member of the newly formed anti-bioterrorism unit on board of an abandoned cruise ship infested with soggy zombie-like creatures. Revelations features similar controls and animations to RE5, but retains the classic slow pacing and darker atmosphere of the original games. Players could also aim their weapon while moving for the first time in the series, though the overall player movement was still slow enough that it retained the claustrophobic feel. Unfortunately, due to budget problems, Revelations was forced to release prematurely, with a substantial amount of content cut from the final build. The game managed to earn positive review scores, however, the game's tendency to dip back into its more action-oriented design kept it from being the full return to form, and the main entries to the franchise were still not ready to go back to being horror games. Continuing to expand the IP, Capcom contracted Slant 6 Games to work on yet another spin-off title called Operation Raccoon City. Slant 6 Games was best known for their contributions to the less than stellar SOCOM title for the PlayStation 3, and unsurprisingly, their take on the Resident Evil series was just as poor. Operation Raccoon City returns to the infamous Raccoon City incident again, only in a sort of non-canonical timeline, where a group of Umbrella operatives are sent in to clean up the mess and hide any evidence of Umbrella's involvement in the outbreak. The game's narrative does absolutely nothing to advance the franchise's lore, and feels more like fan service than anything else, with occasional cameos from characters like Leon and Claire. Raccoon City's gameplay marked the biggest departure from the franchise's horror roots to date, with a full cover-based third-person shooter design inspired by the fast-paced alien shooting action of Lost Planet. Players would unload assault rifles, toss grenades, and blow up explosive barrels as they fought through hordes of zombies in an experience that felt more akin to Left 4 Dead than Resident Evil. Players could team up with their friends in a cooperative mode, or duke it out online in a competitive multiplayer shooter mode, where players would shoot at each other while also avoiding AI enemies. One cool feature in Raccoon City was the new infection mechanic, Players bitten by zombies would acquire mutations at the cost of some health, and if they were killed by the bite, would lose control and watch their zombified corpse attack their teammates. Operation Raccoon City received poor to mixed reviews. Many criticized Capcom for abandoning the fans of the series, and trying to mislead them with false advertisement. And despite this massive fan backlash, Capcom had no choice but to finish production for their next major entry to the series, the entry that would inevitably force their hand. Resident Evil 6 is the perfect example of Capcom not really knowing where to take the franchise. Development for this game began soon after Resident Evil 5 wrapped up, with several different directors pitching different ideas for what the series should do next. In the early years of development, the plan was to make Resident Evil 6 the most horrifying experience the genre had ever seen, a game that, like the original title, would redefine the survival horror experience. However, in the final year of development, Capcom released a public statement that the game had shifted away from being a horror experience due to the survival horror game market being too niche to be profitable. This decision drastically affected the artistic direction of Resident Evil 6, turning it into more of an action shooter game than anything resembling Resident Evil. In Resident Evil 6, players take part in multiple scenarios revolving around the series' mainstays Chris Redfield, Leon Kennedy, Ada Wong, and newcomer Jake Muller, as they seek to end the bioterrorist extensive cover-up once and for all. The plotline is one of the more cinematic and ambitious in the series, and feels like an attempt to finally tie up loose ends and conclude the 16-year-old series. Unfortunately, despite the relatively well-written narrative, Resident Evil 6's gameplay was the biggest departure the series had seen yet. Everything had been simplified to be more accessible to a casual audience. The game starts off immediately with needless quick-time events that don't appear to match the action on screen, and quickly devolves into a series of linear action set pieces with excessive amounts of explosions. The initial scenario involving Leon starts off promisingly, with a dark college campus filled with zombies giving off a serious Resident Evil 2 vibe, but that changes only a few minutes in when you're faced with non-stop zombie killing action, with set piece defense events and situations where you're forced to sprint through zombie hordes. This only gets worse in the other scenarios, where the action is intensified tenfold and the pacing just feels all over the place. Visually, Resident Evil 6 didn't make very many improvements over its predecessor, which can likely be explained by the last minute changes that were made. Though, the animations and new zombie gore system were a noticeable improvement, and I'm curious how many of these assets have been carried over for the Resident Evil 2 remake. Resident Evil 6 was met with poor reception all around. Many stated that the experience was too big of a departure from the survival horror, 
Others who weren't as interested in the original series of games stated that the experience was poor by itself due to the poor implementation of quicktime events, an over-the-top story, and mindless action without any substance. Resident Evil 6 sold well, but it was clear to Capcom that something needed to change. Fans were not as into the action elements as they had previously thought, and rewrites for the next main installment began almost immediately. In 2014, Capcom announced a sequel to Revelations, with their initial intention being that the Revelation series would house their survival horror concepts for the franchise, while the main numbered entries would retain their high-energy action design philosophy. Obviously, the poor reception to Resident Evil 6 convinced them otherwise, but it's an interesting choice nonetheless, and it resulted in a surprisingly well-made sequel that not only returns to the classic explorative horror experience that made the originals great, but also builds upon older ideas, like the cooperative asymmetrical puzzle solving. In the first episode of Revelations 2, players would take control of Claire Redfield again, along with series newcomer Moira Burton, daughter of Barry Burton from the first game. After being kidnapped by an unknown militia, Claire wakes up with Moira in an abandoned prison complex, like the start of Code Veronica. From here, the two work together to escape the prison box and encounter the Afflicted, which remind me a lot of the enemies from The Evil Within. The story is one of the more interesting ones, and gives us a little more insight into Claire and Barry's activities prior to the supposed end of the plot in RE6. Unlike the previous Revelations, Revelations 2 features less of an emphasis on action and significantly more on its horror and puzzle-solving gameplay. Players need to make smart use of both characters and play them to their strengths. In the first episode, for example, players take control of either Claire, who can handle firearms, or Moira, who can shine a flashlight in the environment and search for otherwise invisible resources. This back-and-forth character swapping feels more fleshed out than its implementation in RE0, and the game's solid movement controls and claustrophobic level design help to create a true modern Resident Evil classic. Visually, the game looks decent enough, though the environmental design doesn't do the game justice. Most of the game takes place in dull industrial environments that are ultimately pretty forgettable when compared to the excellent level designs of the older titles. Revelations 2 received okay reviews, with many praising the survival horror concepts and solid gameplay mechanics. The game performed well for Capcom, likely helping sway their creative direction for the main franchise back towards its horror roots. In 2016, Capcom released a downloadable title called Umbrella Corps in hopes that they could branch out into the esports scene with their own action shooter experience inspired by the Resident Evil franchise. Umbrella Corps, however, was a complete disaster of a game. The experience was uninspired and had rudimentary combat controls with boring environmental designs and was pretty much dead on arrival. The game featured no single player story, but instead featured a series of challenge missions in multiplayer maps that often involved killing a set number of infinitely spawning zombies with different weapons. The game was met with overwhelmingly negative reviews, and is one of the lowest rated titles in the series. After the lukewarm reception of Resident Evil 6, Capcom decided to cancel their early concepts for the more action-oriented follow-up and began work on a much more horror-oriented experience. Resident Evil 7 would be one of the darkest entries to the franchise, with a return to the smaller, open-ended level design and a focus on trying to terrify the player again. To showcase this return to form, Capcom invested in a brand new game engine that they called the RE Engine, and demonstrated it with a special virtual reality demo, giving players the chance to experience a portion of the new Baker Mansion environment from the main game. RE7 would also be the first main entry in the series to utilize a western writer for the story, giving the game's narrative a much darker, more western approach to the Resident Evil franchise. Resident Evil 7's story would no longer focus on the initial cast of characters like Leon or Jill Valentine, but instead would introduce a cast of entirely new characters. In Resident Evil 7, players control Ethan Winters, who travels to an old abandoned mansion in Louisiana, pursuing a rumor that his wife may still be alive and had been imprisoned there. But soon after his arrival, Ethan is trapped in the house and is stuck being pursued throughout the game by the owners of the Baker Mansion. Inspired heavily by the more modern survival horror experiences like Amnesia, Resident Evil 7's gameplay would make the player more vulnerable than ever, with weapons becoming more of a last resort, and stealth becoming the most valuable tool to bypass danger. Players would need to find keys and switches to open new paths in the Baker Mansion, while also finding health and ammunition to hold off against the Baker family and the zombie-like mold monsters around the property. The primary antagonists, the members of the Baker family, are unlike anything before seen in the series. Instead of being zombies or horribly disfigured monsters, the Baker family look like completely normal people, making their actions and behavior even more unsettling. Though, the more time you spend with these various individuals, the more you learn how alike they are to the Resident Evil monsters of old. Player movement was once again restricted to walking and short jogs, slowing down the experience to create a more horror-oriented atmosphere. And the added first-person viewpoint allowed for more visceral and disturbing imagery to be shown to the player more easily, 
Resident Evil 7's visuals are easily the best in the series, with near photorealistic environmental designs, an excellent level of detail, and use of lighting. The game also featured a virtual reality option for users on the PlayStation VR, getting players even closer to the survival horror action. Resident Evil 7 was met with good reviews all around, making a return to form for the classic survival horror franchise. Fans loved the well-designed Baker Mansion and the horrifyingly fresh narrative, in addition to the well-implemented first-person camera perspective. Resident Evil had finally returned to being the benchmark for quality survival horror, and the positive fan reception to this decision inspired Capcom to take it a step further and remake one of the series' defining entries. The idea of remaking Resident Evil 2 had been in talks for years, but wasn't officially announced until Fall 2015. After this initial announcement, information regarding the remake was non-existent, with many fearing that the project had been scrapped. But finally, during Sony's E3 2018 conference, a full trailer showcasing a full remake of Resident Evil 2 was revealed, showing off a near-perfect recreation of the environments from the original game. However, rather than attempting another fixed camera remake like the original Resident Evil remake, Capcom decided that this new remake would need a more modern camera design in order to create a unique and more horrifying experience for both fans and newcomers alike. The PlayStation is laid out almost exactly the same, but with some minor tweaks like new rooms, different doors, and keys opening in a different order. The environments are much darker thanks to the actual real-time lighting effects, and the game's story will be much more immersive, with more fleshed out narratives for all the game's characters. Resident Evil 2 aims to bring the horror back to the zombie shooter genre, and if successful, could be one of the very best entries to the Resident Evil franchise, emphasizing the core experience that made the originals timeless classics. Resident Evil has had a long and highly influential run. After 22 years, this series has undergone some substantial changes, always leading the industry with its groundbreaking gameplay mechanics and creative survival horror. It's great to see a franchise that's drifted so far away from its initial great design choices come full circle and begin redefining the genre once more. But it's still unclear where Capcom plans on taking the franchise next. Will they remake another classic Resident Evil experience? Or will they try their hand at another brand new experience like Resident Evil 7? But regardless of where they go next, it's undeniable that the Resident Evil franchise has had a massive impact on not just survival horror, but video games as a whole. But what do you guys think? Are you guys excited for the Resident Evil 2 remake? Which games in the series were your favorite? Let me know in the comment section, and be sure to stay tuned for a detailed comparison and a full review in the coming week. Also, please consider becoming members of my Patreon. Your support will be greatly appreciated. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos posted every week.